And if you guys are okay, we can just, we can roll. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks everyone who's uh, tuning in. It's a big sports day and I'm glad that we have some art and poetry competing with uh, the other big events of the day. But it's, it's my pleasure to have you here and it's my pleasure uh, to moderate this reading and discussion, which I've been looking forward to for months now since we set it up. Uh, I'm Sean Murphy. I am the founder and executive director of 1455. Uh, we are a nonprofit arts organization based out of Northern Virginia. Uh, and our mission really is, is simple and profound. We're, we are trying to celebrate creativity and build community uh, through a variety of, of ways that we want to do that. Uh, certainly in person and increasingly in recent months virtually uh, and today's event is yet another example of ways that we're able to provide some free awesome content to celebrate writers and and allow interaction between uh, writers and audience while we're not able to do that as much as we'd like in real time. Um, as far as 1455 I'll be brief uh, we do conduct a series of free programs. We also feature workshops. We've got a bi-monthly magazine. Uh, we have an interview series. All of this is on our website, so I encourage you to check it out at 1455litarts.org. And you can also check out our event page to see events that are coming up. Um, so again, on behalf of 1455, it's my honor to partner with uh, Anacostia Swim Club and Day 8. And right off the bat, I want to thank and acknowledge two people without whom today's event would not be happening. Uh, the first is Robert Bettman, who runs Day 8, a wonderful nonprofit based in DC. Uh, I encourage you to check them out. We've, we've put links uh, on our website talking about this event. Um, and he's the guy behind the scenes, although he would probably not want me to mention this because he's modest and humble, but he is really the prime mover behind the Anacostia Swim Club. And it's an intentionally ironic name um, for those of you that aren't local, or maybe those of you that are local and don't know, um, the Anacostia Swim Club, the Anacostia River right now, it's currently both unsafe and illegal to swim in the Anacostia. So there's a tremendous uh, local energy to work on ways we can eradicate the pollution and make that historic, beautiful body of water safe again. So that's kind of the mission behind what Anacostia Swim Club is doing. And Robert asked me on behalf of 1455 to partner for these events, which kicked off this weekend. There's gonna be another event the weekend of February 19th, and then another event uh, the weekend of March 19th. So this is the first of three uh, collaborations between 1455 and Anacostia Swim Club. Um, to learn more, and I will put this on our website in the, in the summary, but it's anacostiaswimclub.com. And then the second person I not only um, can thank, but I can introduce, is my friend Catherine Young. Uh, I am so grateful that she immediately agreed to participate and partner on this event. And of course, without her, the uh, reason and being for this event literally would not happen. So Catherine is the, the brains and heart and soul and uh, energy behind this beautiful anthology that I'm personally also very uh, honored to be a part of. I have one of my poems in here. Um, written in Arlington, uh, which I'll explain in a second, but let me introduce Catherine, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how this came to be, and then we've got several contributors to the anthology here with us today, all of whom are going to read some of their own work, and then some folks that couldn't be with us today, these poets have chosen poems from the anthology to read, so it's gonna be an hour plus jam-packed of poetry, but let's start with the most important person here, which is Catherine, Catherine Young is the author of Woman Drinking Absinthe, uh, as well as Day of the Border Guards and editor of Written in Arlington. She's a translator of numerous Russophone poets. She was the 2017 National Endowment uh, for the Arts Translation Fellow, and she served as the inaugural Poet Laureate of Arlington, Virginia, which just makes all the sense in the world. And she'd tell you where her heart lies and where her geography is, you can learn more about her at Catherine with a K dash young dash poet dot com. Um, let me do a quick introduction, but I want to turn the mic over immediately to Catherine to talk about this. But the written in Arlington showcases contemporary poets 
uh, from and poetry about Arlington, Virginia. The anthology contains the work of 87 poets and translators originally, originally written in four languages, including Hindi, Russian, Spanish, and English. The poets whose work appear in this anthology range from nationally known poets to spoken word artists to high school students beginning to write and perform, as well as a few tourist poets who have written about Arlington while passing through. Without further ado, Catherine, welcome. And I'll just start by saying I know that this was very much a labor of love. I think it makes all the sense in the world to just start at the beginning. How did this idea to put something so audacious together and kind of walk us through um, you know, how this came from an idea to something we're holding and reading? Thank you so much, Sean. Um, this was a project that I really wanted to do when I was appointed Poet Laureate. And for a variety of reasons that had to do with local politics and budget, it's that sort of thing. We couldn't do that under that program. And the program was in fact canceled for budgetary reasons uh, after I had done it. And we spent the next year fighting to get it back. But in the meantime, I still wanted to, to do um, this project. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to get. Um, I, when I put out the call for poems, you know, about Arlington, Arlington poets, I literally knew of four poems about Arlington. Three of them were ones that I had written as Poet Laureate. And the fourth one was uh, Miles David Moore's poem um, about the graffiti on Route 395, which is also in this book, I Love uh, Barbie, Barbie Taylor, T. Mick. Um, so that was really the foundational poem, the mother poem, as it were, of, of all of these. And I didn't know what I was gonna get. And it was absolutely astonishing. I got you know hundreds of poems. There were so many poems about foxes that I couldn't take them all. I, foxes are a big thing in Arlington, apparently. Um, I have a fox that I see every night when I go on my walk, so I get that. Um, so we have, we had just hundreds of poems, all, not all of them specifically about Arlington, but many of them by people uh, who were connected to Arlington. We also had a really great archive of the um, poems that appeared on the buses, the moving words poems. They were both adult submissions and uh, submissions by kids. I didn't do, I didn't look at those because I knew getting the permission and finding those kids who won this con you know, contest eight years ago was going to be tough. But the adult poets um, have actually scattered to the winds. They are as far away as Australia. And um, there's some in Ohio, there's some in New York. So, but they're people who had, you know, had their hands in, in the poetry scene here in Arlington. So in any case, I was able to get all of these poems. And we also did a, you know, the, there is this book, it's a, you know, the written book written in Arlington, but we also have a living digital repository called Spoken in Arlington on YouTube. And that's, that takes off where the book stops. It's for anybody who does any performance work. Um, right now, what we have on the site is a lot of the people who have poems in the book reading those poems. But we also have some work, um, like Hanan Saeed's work, which was created digitally mm. and uh, started as, as, the spoken, as the spoken word performance. And then I asked, could I have the script of it to put in the book? So there's that. Um, so we, you know, we just, I had no idea of the riches, even though I had been involved in Arlington po Poetry, for quite some time of just what I was going to get when this, when this thing came together. And, you know, at, at 1455, inevitably, when we talk about community, I think some people, especially in the artistic world, get what we mean by that. It's not just a buzzword. But I think even within the artistic community, there are the, the writers and artists that certainly support their work and the work of others. But then there are the people that really build community. And, and I'd like to definitely make sure that I personally acknowledge you as someone both through this anthology and then the work that you do um, to, to bring communities together. I think this anthology is, is literally and figurative, a way of bringing different um, demographics together in, in one common mission. Um, but it's, it, 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 what people I don't think really understand is how much work goes into that. Uh, you know, of course it has to be a labor of love, but the idea of, of putting something like this together, uh, the inordinate amount of editing and recruiting writing and choosing, maybe talk a little bit about how you, you know, define community and your role as a literary citizen and how that was either tested or augmented through the process of this. Because again, I know that uh, this, this was not something that just came together. It was a considerable achievement. Well, I've, I should say, first of all, that my training in poetry um, largely came because of my experience 
experience with the Russian poets. I lived a good portion of my life in Russia, studying Russian poetry, looking at the role that Russian poets play in public life there. And that really informed um, what I thought about poetry doing. You know, just today I saw a really interesting comment on Facebook by a poet. It was in regard to um, the inaugural poem that we just saw uh, with President Biden's inaugural. And this poet was complaining, you know, anytime a poet does a public poem like that, that, that supports an inauguration or uh, does public work on behalf of some entity, whether it's Arlington County or anything else, that's selling out to the man, that's selling out to the authorities, right? And that's a very American perspective about poetry, that you're somehow sullying your art by doing public art. I don't really come from there. I, I, I really feel like, um, not in all communities, but in many communities in this country, poetry has drifted away from people. Um, and you think of all those poets who, you know, to support poets, they became a tradition in the academic world to hire poets to teach, but then they became, they became academic poets. And they, many of them lost touch with what was going on, you know, outside the academy. And I feel like in the last 10 or 15 years for the white community anyway, we have done a better job of sort of trying to turn back and talk to people and say, you know, uh, where are you coming from? What, what, what is happening in the community with spoken word and performance, these poet, poetic forms. I mean, I sat in a graduate school classroom and heard a, heard a professor say to me, I wouldn't go to bus boys. I don't want to hear that stuff. You know, I, I just, when, when, we, when we shut people out, I mean, people feel shut out by poetry. And part of my feeling about it is we need to, you know, the community, that's us. You know, if we're only writing poems for the page, for the people who can read the page and who have to decode a certain secret aesthetic language to, to hear us, we are not doing our jobs. Um, you know, po what, do, what do artists give to the community? They interact with the community. That's right. Yeah, and you know, I think there are two, two quick things uh, so beautifully stated. I think what's really sad is that some of that historically has been by design. It's a members only, uh, you have to break the code and you have to have a certain level of education or authority. And I think it's so instructive to think about looking overseas to see how uh, art is treated. And I think America is very slowly, uh, to your point, catching up with, this needs to be interactive. This needs to uh, represent a diversity of voices, that this is not something that we don't really need to hear from a bunch of you know, traditionally, obviously, white males in academia. For this poetry to really be representative of, of a topic, it has to uh, carry a lot of demographics. And I, again, want to celebrate the fact that you made that conscious decision um, to not necessarily open the floodgates. I know there was probably a lot of hard choices you had to make, but you clearly wanted to represent a very diverse array from established poets to new beginners. And I think what emerges for anyone that, that reads this or will read this because you should pick this up um, is, is you know, duh, uh, a real sense of place emerges that I don't think would be possible uh, if you had, you know, a smaller demographic or for lack of a better cliche, you know, a more uh, fuddy-duddy demographic. You're getting a real, you get to take a nice bite out of the local area and you get that flavor through the different poets included here. Well, I mean, there's more to do, obviously, uh, but I, I will say in, in also in support of this book that it was funded by a grant from Arlington County. Um, and so the county itself was was looking to, uh, I mean, they, they do a very small number of grants. I do a, you know, a handful, three, four, five a year to various artists in different disciplines. Um, and part of the um, uh, criteria for, for being eligible is your project has to build community. So, so Arlington is also looking, I mean, you know, Arlington, I've lived in Arlington since the eighties and um, I have thought of ourselves, of us, my community as a bedroom community for DC. And it's only when I was working as poet laureate and having to write poems about Arlington, when I went into the archives at the library, started looking at who we are, where we come from, who our old, our elders in the poetry world are here. And they are really interesting people, you know, to, and to, to so, um, it's our fault too that we in Arlington are sometimes take our, our location for granted that we don't think that we had important and, and, and interesting things happening here. We've had amazing historical events take place in our community. And while most of those are not celebrated in this book, one of the things that this book does do is grapple um, in ways that were changing even as the book was coming out with the legacy of Robert E. Lee. 
because in the time that this book came, went to press and where we are now, Arlington has acted decisively to strip the name of Robert E. Lee from quite a number of, uh, you know, uh, we're trying to get rid of the name Lee Highway, for example. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a bill in the, in the Virginia uh, General Assembly right now to give us the authority to do that. So um, it's a changing, um, um, a changing sense of our history. There's a poem in here about Halls Hill which is the traditionally African-American neighborhood. And there is a segregation wall that was built and still, you can still go down there and see the remnants of it. So we are, we, things happened here. Well, and you know, it, it just underscores the fact that art, just like history is never static. It's always evolving. And our understanding of the past is informed by the present and et cetera. And all these uh, competing forces are at play. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now is it's in the service of a more inclusive, and diverse voice, not for any politically correct reason, it's for that to get a real authentic expression, you wanna have authentic voices from a wide variety. But I also want to, before we, before we start hearing some poems, my last comment on this section is, I do want to thank you for kind of reclaiming Arlington because as a lifelong Northern Virginian, in fact, I'm rocking my Virginia's for writers short shirt, um, you know, growing up, in Reston in Northern Virginia and spending a lot of time in Arlington, working in Arlington, I still would tell people from out of town, yeah, I live in DC because it was just easier for people to get their heads around. And so this is a good step toward claiming Arlington. You know, this is where the, the Pentagon is and, you know, Amazon just came to Crystal City. So um, good on you for having the necessary, I think, pride and aspiration to say, yeah, Arlington, we're not DC. We're part and parcel, we're all connected, but Arlington is its own place and it is warrants, uh, you know, has the history and the talent to support something like this. So thank you. Thank you, thank Sean. You. I also want to say that we're going to hear from an, a native Arlingtonian, at least one today and among our readers, Sally Zachariah, uh, born and bred and still living in Arlington. So um, I, f I feel like a real newbie in, in comparison because I came <laughs> much later. Right on, Bamba. We're all, we're all part of the, the Arlington family, at least artistically, if nothing else. Um, but I think that sets it up. I, Catherine, if you would be uh, inclined, we had talked about, there were a couple of poems in particular uh, when you and I were chatting uh, before the event that you thought really kind of set up both the anthology and would, would work well to kind of kick us off. So um, if, if you would be kind enough, I believe you've got a poem from contributors Karen Wood and Kim O'Connell. I will pass the conch to you and let you introduce those poems and read them. And then, as promised, we'll go through, we've got a bunch of contributors here in real time, and we're going to hear from them. So I will zip it and step out of the way and, and let you take it away. Super. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I wanted to introduce, these are the first two poems in the book, and I'll just say a little bit about how the book works. Um, I sort of started with a, so I had never had this situation before. I have edited a lot of books, but I had never been able to compile a book and so what I had was a stack of 150 poems. And I, they started talking to each other. It was so exciting because this poem sounded like it belonged next to that poem. And this poem sounded like it belonged with a third poem. And it, they sort of, you know, organized themselves. And the way the book works is it starts with the bird's eye view, looking over the river, flying into uh, Washington, what is now Washington Reagan Air Airport, um, and looking at the parkway and the natural landscape of the, li of the river. And then we start looking geographically for, you know, at our neighborhoods with Rosslyn and Courthouse. Um, uh, Todd's got a poem about uh, Courthouse. But so these are, the, these are the first two poems in the book. And um, the first poet is Karen Wood, who is no longer with us, very sadly. She died uh, about two years ago. Uh, she was very young. She was not yet 60. Uh, she's a Native American poet, and uh, if you don't know her work, I strongly recommend it because she is a marvelous, marvelous poet. Um, this book, this poem is called First Light, and it's from her book Markings on Earth. First Light by Karen Wood. At this hour, who could discern where land ends, where water, where creek becomes bay, bay becomes river, and stretches across to a blue verge of Maryland, all the way black now, invisible. Through July's haze, the first light is a brush stroke of gray sweeping, seeping in. Ducks totter up the beach, short 
bow-legged sailors. Over the water, duck blinds loom as improbable creatures to graze a pale field. From the marina around the bend, two crabbers set out. Their diesel chugs reverberate as prows cut new waves. Mockingbirds swoop, flash their shoulders like women advertising summer dresses. Herons cast themselves down. What matters? At the end, we become what we have loved. Each thing that transfixed us in the rapture of its moment, its grace of its own making, ours the same. We grow around the land as it grew around us, and dawn crosses over us, whether asleep in nests or births in the ground becoming life again. Here is the moment, here among herons, ospreys, morning, river. I believe in this light. It is the light of the world. Karen Wood. And the second poem that I'm going to read is by Kim O'Connell, uh, who's not with us today. Um, but I want to say a word about Kim in addition to her poetry. We had a couple of people in this anthology who I could not find anywhere. I found their poems and I could not find them to get permission. And Kim O'Connell, who uh, is both a poet and a journalist, um, helped me track some of them down. So you're seeing some of the poems in the book thanks to Kim's work. Uh, but here is her poem. It's called Touching Down Runway 119 by Kim O'Connell. The green folds of the mountains tell me we are close. I press my cheek to the glass. There they are, below and beyond. The winding highway, the familiar grid, the high rises pretending to be skyscrapers. There are the gravestones, the trees, the trails, the river flashing like fish scales, guiding us as it has for longer than we know. Lower and lower, hanging, holding, an intake of breath until we jolt back to earth. This place I carry with me, blinking its lights in welcome. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for reading those and, and for choosing those. Um, again, as someone that has flown into that airport, um, and I think anyone that's flown into that airport, that just conjures up that very unique experience of how you enter the little space between DC and, and where, nor where Northern Virginia really begins. Um, just a great place setter for the rest of us. Um, so let's, let's keep the, uh, the poetry flowing. Our first uh, contributor uh, to read today is Sally Zachariah, and I'd be happy to introduce her. Sally's poetry has appeared in some 75 print and online journals. She's been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net. Her publications include Muslim Wife, The Unknowable Mystery of Other People, Personal Astronomy, and When You Escape. The editor of a poetry anthology entitled Joys of the Table, she blogs at the wonderfully titled but does it rhyme .com. Sally, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot, Sean, and I want your shirt, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's great. Uh, Catherine mentioned that uh, uh, I'm a native Arlingtonian, one of the probably very few, and I'm talking about a long time ago. Um, I grew up in the 40s in Arlington, uh, and I moved away, but I came back. But anyway, when I was growing up, um, I lived, I went to a school called Stonewall Jackson Elementary School. <clears throat> Thank God it is now called Arlington Traditional School or something like that. Um, but yeah, that, that's what Arlington was a long time ago. The first poem I want to read is about the street where I grew up. Um, it's called Edison Street Excavation. They couldn't leave the farm behind when they moved to our block the whole unruly lot of them. Aunts, uncles, cousins, coming and going, coupling and uncoupling, and always clinging to them the memory of the plow. It was a post-war suburb, square faceless brick, perfunctory lawns, but on an extra lot, they grew corn and beans and grapes and built a shed, one side for chickens, the other for a mule. 
The youngest girl and I played forts and fantasies in the brambles by the tracks that faced their lot. A daily train clattering by at five o'clock, rousing the dogs, telling us day was running down. Still, the hint of the fields hovers somehow in the air. The almost smell of dry straw, faint scratch of chickens, brambles prickle on a child's remembered shin. The house is still there. I haven't been by for a long time. Um, the other song, poem I'd like to read is called September Song. It seemed like the ruination of everything, yet we went on. Some things got better, some got worse, and we were left marveling at what we could handle, wondering what would come next. Three miles from the Pentagon, we saw a rain of objects, stuffing from airplane seats, floating, drifting, insubstantial yet consequential, some landing on the office roof, while inside we watched it all unfold in real time on the screen. Years later, we are still wondering, wondering after a summer of destruction overseas, disparity at home, slaughter of innocents in the streets, dreading now what could come next. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, yeah, again, I, as, and, and as someone that, that was here uh, local during 9-11, um, right. just an indelible, I mean, it's certainly for the, the country and the world, but I think, again, we can lay claim to having kind of a unique perspective because that was exactly. our home uh, being attacked and nothing was ever the same for better. And as you- I was at the office and, and it was coming down from, it was horrifying, yeah, as yeah. you know. Yeah, well, you conjure a beautiful for such a uh, for such a a heavy subject. Uh, you prove what poetry can do, which is uh, somehow make it both uh, poignant and and more powerful without you know the the horror of a newscast. So thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Brian Donnell James. Uh, and I'll introduce Brian. He's the 2020 United Nations Food and Agriculture. World Food Day Poetry First Prize winner. He's also a 2020 National Poetry Writing Month contest winner. He's a poet, a writer, and a public speaker who's been published in Africa, Europe, and throughout the United States. Brian, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. I'll go into uh, the piece. Uh, the piece is uh, Sweet Tones, Somber Tones. And uh, I wrote it because uh, I wanted to be cool and I wasn't. <laughs> and so I, uh, I imagined this uh, story and I'll share it with you now. Thank you again. Sweet tones, somber tones. Sweet tones, somber tones in the night sky. See, me all alone with this here old horn as my only ally, but I'm feeling good feeling jazzy, playing up a storm, and people hearing my sound, now they're coming in to get warm. Heads swing slowly, sort of side to side, fingers popping, and I'm filled with pride, because I'm entertaining my people in the chocolate city. I got my eye on that dark-skinned girl looking pretty, fever running, running wild, and this old woman say, go ahead, play it, child. Ain't no worry, just dancing and fun. See, we're none like this when the night begun. Yeah, these my peoples jam packing the place. You see, I'm proud of my culture and I'm proud of my race and I'm giving them back something for what they gave me. And I'm loving every minute, playing this old horn real jazzy. Short hair, cornrows, scarves, and braids going out into the cold night as all the fun fades. Sweet tones, somber tones in the night sky. <clears throat> Me all alone with this he old horn as my only ally. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Wonderful poem, wonderfully read. Um, Thank you. Do, do us a favor and talk a little bit about what were there some particular uh, landscapes you had in mind when you were conjuring up some of those images? 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as is, was alluded to earlier, uh, the whole DMV actually, uh, for me, doesn't have any borders. Um, and uh, of course, there's a strong African-American uh, culture in all three uh, areas. And so I sort of took from all of them. Uh, but uh, as a teenager, I used to perform rap music and I also uh, played the trumpet. And we used to perform at a few jazz clubs in the Arlington area specifically. Um, and so um, that's really where the, uh, the nature of all of that came from. Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. All right. Okay. Next up is Todd Ibrahim, and I will introduce him. Todd is the Executive Vice President of the American Society of Nephrology, a two-time recipient of George Washington University's Jenny McKean Moore Scholarship for Poets. Todd has a master's degree in liberal arts from Johns Hopkins University and a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Maryland College Park. Todd, read us some poetry, please. Well, thank you, Sean. And just to, you know, I really appreciate being included today and also to thank uh, Karen for, uh, I'm sorry, thank Catherine for reaching out. Um, she had mentioned the, um, the Moving Words uh, program in Arlington and, and the second poem I'm gonna read um, a part of that was featured, and I think that's how she um, found me, and I really appreciate it. So it's great to be part of the anthology, and it really is fun to go back and sort of think about how it's organized, and now I have a, a little bit of an insight in terms of the neighborhoods. And, and this first poem, which is entitled On Building, um, I, I've lived in Arlington since the early um, 90s, but, but before that, spent a fair amount of time here, and I'm struck by how there's just been so much building. You had mentioned uh, sort of the national landing area at Crystal City and things, and how much that has changed. And, um, you know, I think this, this poem is sort of two stories that kind of fold into one, but it really is about Arlington. Um, so, unbuilding for B. They demolished the building this week that stood for years near the courthouse. It reminded me of you and your wife because we watched the fireworks from its roof five months before your winter wedding. As I saw the wrecking ball whack masonry walls, her demolition hammers chop floor slabs, breathe clouds of concrete dust, I was reminded of fireworks. When its frame became clearer, when I understood its structure, the relationship between columns and girders, I saw unbuilding is like a, your marriage, which failed to last three seasons. Should she have left sooner, admitted the lost attraction, said she was drawn to you no longer? You'll never know why the designs failed, why she stopped loving. Your best man in church and witness in court, I played the same part, promising to serve as a rubble shoot, carrying debris from the top of the building to the transfer box to the street. The second poem I'd like to read is, is um, not really about Arlington in the sense that it's, the, it's more sort of the geography of Maryland and it's the Kent Narrows. And I'm sure Sally uh, remembers driving to, to the beach and, and you used to have to stop and there was a drawbridge and they've taken care of that. And so um, it just really added to the time. But I feel like I spent so much of my time sort of waiting for the bridge and thinking about things. And that's where this poem comes from. So it's more of a, I guess, a, a DMV sort of poem extended, if you will. Uh, the Kent Narrows. This is what I know. Your eyes always seem more green in my mind. That is what I'll keep. Everything else goes to the next the way it came to me. I'd like to think I'm giving more than I took, but I know selfishness. So in turn for keeping the memory of your eyes, I give you nakedness and afternoons alone together. I give you everything you told me and everything I thought. In turn for keeping, I understand the world through your eyes and see the stars moments before the sky. Feel you sitting on the last step, your feet bare to the sand, your eyes to the Atlantic, your back full to the sun setting. I'd always thought we'd lose our bodies and from there form wonder. I'd always thought we'd lose ourselves and form nothing. The line between wonder, nothing, is the unseen between late afternoon and dark, where I am now, stopping near the end of a two-mile backup at the Kent Narrows Bridge. 
With the road longer this late, the body moves outside, making the outside part of the body, making the darkness more lamp black within me. These things move up through the stillness, through the body, up from the road to the sky. In waiting for the bridge to come down, I think of you heading up the stairs, your feet bare to the wood, your back full to the water, your eyes green to the sky. Thanks. Wow, Todd, thank you for sharing those. What just, uh, I, I celebrate the, the kind of deep psychological history that you convey, like almost short story-ish uh, narrative in those poems. And really, uh, again, as someone that, that I think knows the places you speak of uh, geographically really resonates. I appreciate that a lot. Thanks. Okay, uh, back to the future. So Catherine, we've talked about uh, her work as an editor and, and community builder, uh, literary citizen. She also happens to be a brilliant poet. So I would love Catherine to read a couple of her poems. Uh, plus I believe there's one in translation that she, she would read. Thank you, Sean. You know, I was gonna read the poem about Boston, but I think instead I'm gonna read one of the ones that I wrote as a uh, poet laureate, just because we've been talking about community and what we have to do to put together community. And um, I, I wanna say that this poem um, is not my favorite poem that I've ever written, but that's not what its purpose was. Its purpose was to try to think about um, our community, where we come from, who is active in it, uh, what cultures are involved here. So it's it's sort of a programmatic poem um, and it was commissioned. I had to write poems for various events as laureate and this one was for the Columbia Pike Blues Festival. So it's called Columbia Pike Blues and it's uh, it was written for the, the festival that was held in 2017. And by the way, to, uh, you can ask me about this afterwards if you want, but I, I did spend hours in, uh, in the library archives trying to find out the history of Columbia Pike, which is a fascinating road. It was you know, one of the original Arlington roads. Uh, it was, if you think about the Civil War period, it was the only road that connected the north of this country and the south of this country. And everything, like when, when people got in their carriages and rode out to see what was happening in the Manassas battle, that very first battle, um, they went out Columbia Pike. So it's, it, it, it is probably the most important road in Arlington and probably the most historic as well. So Columbia Pike Blues. What is it that we want from our roads? To cart tobacco to port, raw grain to mill, cattle to abattoir. To take us out in the morning, crossing footpaths made by others, past clay forts turned to brickworks, where a man and a woman born enslaved are buying supplies for the first brick townhouse. To take us to the river, the ferry, the bridge, the school, the store, diner, theater, botanica, iglesia, taqueria, to lead us back home. You have to sit a spell in a place to capture its full flavor, to watch from your front porch as the roads straightened and smoothed, see the couple from Barcroft throttle the bus gamely uphill. Watch abandoned pastures sprout radio towers to talk with Paris. Thrust up garden apartment blocks where bachelors starch clean uniforms for tomorrow's shift at the Pentagon. Embrace a church, rebuild a school, bury a loved one in its soil. You have to listen to a place a long time to hear its blues. Forest to farm, hills sown with stones, Friedman's village, Queen City paved to park cars. Streetcars falter, no longer leave the lot. Metro junctions gape empty, the line unbuilt. Even the Porsches are long gone now. And always, the quiet padding of feet from long houses by the river as the ghosts of the land's first settlers carve out new trails up ahead. Thanks. Uh, I can read another one, but I think actually I'd rather talk about this one if you wanna ask me about it because literally every line in this poem has something to do with Arlington history. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so obvious, but I mean, I, I, uh, having read it and, and heard it, there's probably a lot that I still picked up on. So I absolutely talk a bit about, um, and it sounds like that was almost a poem you felt you had to write. You know, there's a real urgency. Uh, not ur maybe that's not the right word, but a real sense of an appreciation uh, and homage to history and, and the place that you call home that definitely <laughs> conveys. Very much so. I, one of my majors in college was history, so it's probably not unusual. Um, but in looking back at what Columbia Pike was and, and what happened there, there really was um, uh, the mill, the Arlington Mill, which is still there, um, which is where a lot of you know, people were coming there. I think uh, the mill was one of the very first sort of buildings or, or entities that was there. And they used to come down from Robert E. Lee's plantation at Arlington House um, to get their mill, you know, their work, their mill, uh, their um, grain ground there. There was at one point an abattoir, um, slaughterhouse in that area. Um, and of course, Columbia Pike starts right at the bank of the river, which is where the first, when the first Europeans uh, sailed up the river, I believe it was 1611, they found people living there. Um, at what is the foot of now the 14th Street Bridge, the Long Bridge, uh, which it later became. Um, and then that area, which is now the Pentagon, uh, because there's so much clay in the river, uh, in the river uh, banks, was made into a brickworks. And uh, people took those bricks, and they built a lot of things around Arlington, including the first brick townhouse, uh, which was built, and you can still see it, it's just off Columbia Pike, by uh, a couple who had met as enslaved people on uh, Arlington House Plantation. But after the war, they bought the bricks from the brickworks, and they built their house just off Columbia Pike. Um, and of course the, the Pike takes us so many places and it's changed over the years, even in the years that I've lived here. Um, it's taken on uh, many people from cultures from Central and South America. Um, at the time when I first came here, there was a Thai restaurant. I don't know if that's still there in a motel across from the McDonald's. So lots and lots of people have come through there. Um, and in the, in the 40s when Arlington was exploding, there were these radio towers that were seen from a long way away. Um, that they would broadcast the first transatlantic calls calls to Paris. Um, and there's a lovely uh, woman who lived um, on Columbia Pike starting, I think, as early as the 40s, maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, but in her, her late middle age, she began uh, publishing a newsletter about Columbia Pike. And, you know, it was all a sort of uh, so-and-so came to visit, you know, the grown-up child from, from Pittsburgh came and brought his kids in. And then this was built, and then this store was sold. And, and then she retired and moved out to the Eastern Shore, and she kept publishing the gossip of Columbia Pike into the 1980s. Um, so there's all this stuff in our library, and, and there's, I mean, there's so much to learn about this community. And, 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 and we can find it. We can recover it. We just haven't done it yet. So, sorry, that's too much about Columbia Pike history, but I just became fascinated by it. No, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to have learned. I, I didn't know that that was the main through fare, north and south, and, and that that was really the, the road. I don't, I don't know how many, I wonder how many other Northern Virginians are aware of that history. So, I think it's important. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Catherine. Um, okay, our next poet is Jessica Claire Haney whom I will introduce. She is an Arlington-based writer, editor, and tutor. Her work has appeared in Beltway Poetry Review, Porcupine Literary, Court Green, Earth's Daughters, Scary Mommy, The Huffington Post, The Washington Post, uh, two Grace and Gravity anthologies from the Paycock Press, a local press, by the way, and is forthcoming in Gargoyle. You can learn more at jessicaclairehaney.com. Jessica, glad you're here today. So glad to be here, Sean. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to Catherine and to Day 8 and the Anacostia Swim Club, and I've loved the Summer Literary Festivals of 1455, so thank wow. you so much for those. Thank you. Um, so I was thinking about the, what my two poems in this anthology have in common, and I thought they're both moments of transition. And then I feel like a lot of what has come about, as people have been reading, is also about moments of transition. And you said earlier, Sean, you know, art is always evolving. And I had been thinking, you know, we're always evolving too. And the, the moments I've tried to capture here are those sort of in between places, but um, we all really are always, there are always competing forces at play, you said earlier. And so I think these are trying to capture them. Um, my poems are both toward the back of the book 
um, in sort of the seasonal nature section. And the first one is called Pace. She did not realize how long the magnolia bloomed, its silken pink cups folding steadier than a child's hand scooping water, until the year they emerged early, this time before his birthday and before a late snow that was actually white, not the cream rims of the blossoms it covered and filled. That year brought an abrupt end to their glory. Shocked and frozen, the blossoms curled and blackened the very next day and clung for a few more before carpeting the lawn in decay, leaving empty weeks of sky through silver branches before the green dared make its way forth to fill the spaces. And the second poem is at a different seasonal transition or uh, mind transition anyway, um, it's called 11-1. The first of November doesn't bother to even whisper. It just sits still, breathing shallow, a giant sprawled out in sleep, cheek to ground. Pumpkins squat heavily, singed and molding, their foreheads sinking and smiles dimming. November 1st closes its eyes rather than laugh in your face about obsolete orange. Its sky knows only how to be gray. At this 11th hour, trees shake off leaves toward clean silhouettes, a last chance for a new start, to gather up the clutter of the past year's promises to soften small gray balls of fuzz into one mass before shoving everything under the bed from Advent until Christmas has passed, when the new, the real newness starts. Thank you. Wow, thank you. And, and, and Catherine, it's so obvious why, um, in addition to the quality of all these poems, the, the readers that you wanted to represent today, giving us just such a great cross-section of you know, again, geography, um, people, places, but, but weather, which as any Northern Virginia knows, right? Uh, it's something that we, we love because we get the four seasons, but if there's anything that Arlingtonians and Northern Virginians can do is complain about the weather, which maybe is inherent to any area, but I, as a lifelong resident, I, I certainly have, have come to really appreciate and not take for granted that we get these transitions from, uh, Jessica, as you point out, from, you know, sort of cold, to maybe real cold and, and then the rebirth in the spring, et cetera. But boy, in Northern Virginia, we, we, we do get that treat of at least uh, nothing's ever the same, <laughs> which uh, on cold days, I, that, that's not the greatest thing, but uh, most of the time it's wonderful. So thank you for, for sharing that imagery with us. Um, our next poet was going to be, uh, we had invited uh, Hanan Said. I believe she's unable to make it, but I, I reckon, um, we should represent her work, Catherine. Definitely, I think so. Um, so if you go to the YouTube channel and um, if, do you want me to send you the link to that? Can we share the screen on that or should we read the poem maybe and then I can embed the, I can embed the video? Um, we, should share, we should share the screen if we can because her performance is so, so good, if we can. I'm not sure I know how to do that on Zoom. Click share screen and then just open up the video. Okay. You may have to enable sharing screen for you. It looks like it can be done though. Well, maybe I can give you, hold on, if I make you uh, pause. Okay. Do you want to see if you can do it? I will look. Okay. I am a technically challenged person. Okay, we'll get through this. Videos. Here we go. Um, I will try to share my screen and then if I can, I will go to full screen because it's small right now. Okay. Yes, it's working. Great.
So that's Anand, and uh, she is a graduate, I believe, of Washington at Liberty. And um, I wish she could be here to get it today, but you can see the, the text of the poem in um, her, um, in the book. Okay, and I don't know. I, I'm trying so to get rid of the music, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, some of, us, some of us couldn't hear. I'm not sure if that was everyone or uh, some of us on the call, but why don't, why don't we, Jessica, are you going to read the poem for us too so we can make sure we, everyone watching gets to hear it? I can. Is everybody getting music in their background or is it just me? No, I'm, I'm not hearing any music. Okay. So I can read the poem. It's a long poem and I can't do it justice, but I will try. It's called, That's Not a Religion. All right, uh, by Hadnan Said. It's crazy how three numbers can turn me from a friend to a flight threat, like I had the ability to turn my watch to a bomb set. And anytime I spoke an Arabic phrase, they would all look so afraid, like saying, Assalamu alaikum was code for it, let's blow up the place. And I apologize for the 19 inhumane, but note that 99% of us are sane. Maybe I'm overreacting. Honestly, what country would take the actions of a few and blame it on a whole civilization? I thank God we don't live in that nation. I live in the land of the free, sworn up and down for both you and me, but freedom is tested throughout history. So forgive me if I don't see too blind and deaf to see sanity and never hear the reality in a land where freedom doesn't really come free. Stares, screaming whispers, and pity. Anytime a teacher brings up New York City, I'm labeled, organized on the media's table. Those Muslims are so unstable, fighting in armies against peace. The more of us, the more crime rates increase. 3,000 deceased, and I apologized numerous times, even though I know it had nothing to do with me. You call me that girl with the veil that's oppressed, but when you see a nun walk around, you give her the utmost respect. But I want you to get to know me and what I believe. Don't let them twist your mind, they deceive. Don't trust everything that is said. All the media want is hatred to be spread. And tomorrow I'll introduce you to my scarlet letter. When I was a little girl, I never walked next to my mother because of how others viewed her. They didn't even know who we were. 
All those stares, all those words never phased her. All I wanted was to be from here, but swearing to this country would mean I was to forget I'm from there. How do you forget what brought you here in the first place? It's like looking at my ma and saying, what you are is a waste. I'm from here today. All the struggles, all the history that goes through my veins is no more than just history now. Insane. But today I'll tell them I'm from there and I say it proudly because these ignorant idiots don't know anything about me. Now try not to see what is seen and listen to me. There is terrorism and there, and there, and there are terrorists living, but I'm here to remind you that that's not a religion. I pity the media because their minds need help. Love me or hate me just as long as you do it by yourself. I, I, I break stereotypes on a daily basis. A slick worded hijabi, ooh, you should have seen their faces. So when I introduce myself tomorrow, I want you to know me and not the preconceived idea of me. Hanan Said. I'm, I'm, thank you for reading that. And um, you know, for, for everyone that couldn't hear, I, I like the imagery, the video, even if I couldn't hear it, but that's a reminder for everyone checking this out that there is this spoken in Arlington and people should check out some of these readings or all of these readings um, because it's just more, more meat on the bone. So thank you for that, uh, making sure that Hanan was represented today. And speaking of representing poets that are not with us, I believe we agreed we were going to go back through the order, which I can, I can go through here. And uh, I believe all of our poets have uh, chosen another poem from someone uh, that they can read, which I think would be really special. So we start at the top with Sally. And then, wait, uh, wait, 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 we haven't heard from Susan. <laughs> oh, Susan, I'm so sorry. I, I've got my notes here. And Susan, I apologize. So hold <laughs> that thought. For everything I just said, we'll do that in a second. Susan, forgive me, we got thrown off because of Hanan. Let me introduce Susan and apologize egregiously because I've got all my notes right in front of my face. Susan has flown on helicopters in body armor in Iraq for the US State Department and makes a mean Berblanc sauce. Her work has appeared in a number of publications including Gyroscope, written in Arlington, Penumbra, Joys of the Table, and American Literary. Susan, we save the uh, best reader for last. Again, my humble apologies. Please read some poems. We did not need to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. And thanks, Catherine, very much for including me in this project. It's been wonderful and a great community of poets. Um, and then also thanks to Anna Costia Swim Club and to Sean for um, leading this great, this great event today. The first poem I'll read is about a dear family friend of, of mine um, when I was a child, but it's also about kind of when people feel as though they have to live as lies. And it's called, What is Lost, 1987. Trees like sentinels filed past our car window, white iced in mourning. Purses like crows circled and stopped, leaving him finally in the officer's section in Arlington. Once he fed his children and me French toast with just a dash of Kahlua, smoked cigars at the local swim club, wore teeny tiny Speedos while the other dads sported baggy swim trunks, brushed his pilot wings with sunlight flew our families to Puerto Vallarta. How our bodies fail us. His diminished into a shadow of a shadow. His mind departed like a sandcastle, a wave washes away. To obtain a just burial, his family said cancer when they meant AIDS, or he'd have had no seven gun salute, no flag covered casket. Um, the second poem I'll read today is called Biking the Washington and Old Dominion Trail. Like many in Arlington, I'm an avid bicyclist and have spent many, many hours on all of the bike trails along the river and out 
uh, to Vienna and beyond. And sometimes I'm not thinking at all. Sometimes I'm just biking, but sometimes like I think other athletes, I am kind of working through things. So that's what this is about. Biking the Washington and Old Dominion Trail. Fast and it's windy and dusty. Sweat drips between her breasts. She clips her shoe onto the pedal and she's melded to the bicycle as if to a lover. She pumps up hills, whooshes down them. She thinks perhaps the more miles she rides on this chrome alloy frame with Shimano parts, her calves clenching until she's sinew, this ache can be fixed as easily as a flat bicycle tire. Glue, a new tube, a gush of air, and she'll be all right again. Enjoying the smell of the pine copses, seeing the startled deer leap into the underbrush as she passes by. Right on, thank you so much. And, and uh, let me offer a humble prayer that WNOD's bike riders, walkers, and dog walkers can one day unite in peace and not <laughs> Ate each other's guts on site. Um, boy, do we get a cross section of humanity um, all the way out to Reston. Uh, I live right on the WNOD and usually go west just because it's less traffic. Um, and that, so you not only do you conjure that, Susan, but Catherine, that made me think of the Columbia Pike and, and just thinking about some of these landmarks that have either been repurposed, um, the fact that that was a, you know, train tracks that's now a bike path, bike trail, walking trail, and the history. Um, inherent in that, which I remember it just as a little kid, when you'd get to certain mile markers and you could actually stop, I guess you still can, and read what that was 20 or 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, it really kind of puts things in perspective as far as how things are not like they used to be geographically and uh, 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 socially, et cetera. Uh, but that's a, I'm glad that's represented in the book because it's, those of us that live here know that that's, uh, that's where the real warriors uh, go to exercise and congregate. So thank you for that. And, and please forgive me again for inadvertently running past you in the running order. I was so hung up on the fact that Hanan hadn't joined us. So um, as promised, now uh, let's represent some poets that are not with us, and if that's okay. And if you're agreeable, Sally, you can kick off with the uh, poem and poet you chose. First, um, one of the great things about living in Arlington, there's so many parks, there's so much open space. Uh, the WNOD Trail, which was the railroad track I wrote about in my early poem, um, there's just everywhere you can be, it's outside. So I've chosen a poem by a good friend of mine, Rebecca Leet, who is with Susan and I, we're in a little poetry group and a few other people, uh, and she's written about one of my favorite topics, which is birds. So Rebecca's poem is No Birds in the Bog. Not yet midwinter, a grim sky shrouds desolate treetops. Ice melts soil to sludge. The human heart beats as in a bog. Not so the heart of a downy woodpecker whose staccato drilling breaks the silence as she hunts for breakfast or the lone blue jay who lustfully whistles for company, his indigo body stark against white sycamore bark, or a flamboyant male cardinal trilling pretty as he surveys mallards fishing in the frigid four mile run. Excellent, thank you, Sally, and for making sure that our, our beautiful birds are represented. Absolutely. Very appropriate. Okay, Brian, did you uh, have a, a poet you wanted to represent today? Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, mention my dear friend, uh, Aaron R., uh, the poet. He had a wonderful poem uh, called Darkest Days, Loneliest Nights. Um, unfortunately, I didn't choose that because if you know Aaron, he's such an incredible uh, reader with, with his wordplay and inflection. I, I, I'm afraid I, I could not I could not uh, do it a disservice, um, but I did choose Dandelion, which was a poem uh, written by Madeline Rosenberg. And I uh, found the poem uh, eloquent and beautiful, so I will share that with you. 
dandelion. I wanted to show you how to press one ragged nail into dandelion flesh, how to split the stem and inch your finger up until you meet the flower's fur. Leave the green stalk in curls like Marie Antoinette's and your fingers sticky with summer's milk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Todd. Um, so this is uh, interesting because it looks like Brian and I have a, a similar sensibility because I also selected a poem by uh, Madeline Rosenberg, um, both because I really enjoyed it, um, but also it's about um, Air's hardware store in, uh, in Westover. Oh, yeah. And um, that's my wife's favorite store in Arlington. Uh, mine's probably Arrow Wine and Cheese, so that gives you a little insight into our, our relationship. Um, <laughs> but I just thought this poem was charming and clever and just really well executed. Um, so it's again, it's entitled Airs. The man says, I can probably find the Holy Grail in here if I look hard enough. But he is neither religious nor an archaeologist, and he finds instead an egg timer, molly bolts, copper pipes, a BTEC scarf that would never be mistaken for a shroud, plaster of Paris, mouse traps, baseball bats, suet, a mason jar that will store brandied peaches too, to ferment, too fermented to eat at some anonymous supper. He leaves with seeds and a vow to dig. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, Catherine, I think we're going to do you last, right? Because you're going to read something by Hillary. And, and last one mistaken, and you have two. I was going to do also one by John Ellsberg um, Great. at some point. You want to do that one now and then do the Hillary? Sure. Or? Yeah, yep. So this is by the late John Ellsberg, uh, who for years ran, and let me put my video on. Just that, please um, do. Yeah. Uh, this is by the late John Ellsberg, who for years ran, I think, the open mic at Cafe Muse. He was a fixture in Arlington poetry. Um, and this poem was um, suggested to me by Kim Roberts. So I wanted to give a shout out to her because she was really important in helping me think about what this anthology could be. Uh, as most of you know, she's done a lot of anthology work for, for DC poets in general, uh, DC's writers' houses. Um, and she was really helpful to me in conceptualizing this particular book and also pointing out poets who I had never heard of before in our history. Um, so thanks to Kim. This is John Ellsberg's Virginia in late August. There is a softness in Virginia light in late August, the light promises of the good days of autumn to come. It is the reward for enduring all that sweltering heat of midsummer. It does not pretend to, ha to have dark shadows. It is the light of unwinding, of having a beer on the reclaimed front porch, feet propped on the rail. It is the light that gives a distance to all, those small defeats of the past, a softness that comes from that coolness after mowing, that makes any virtue as easy as the curl of the bead on the glass at rest. Thank you. That's fantastic. John Ellsberg. Thank you. Okay. And Jessica, who did you choose? Um, well, I chose our current poet laureate. Um, so it's Holly, is it Kara Petkova? Is that correct? Is that the correct pronunciation? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So um, she's obviously great. Um, the reason I chose her poem, Donaldson Run, which is just opposite Rebecca Leith's poem that was previously read, The Birds and the No Birds in the Bog. Um, is because of my fondness for the outdoors. And um, I love the poems about the WNOD and Four Mile Run. I've spent a lot of time on those trails. And I, I did early on when I moved, first moved to Arlington in 1997. But then after I had kids, I was, I was not well for a period of time. I had Lyme disease for a long time. And I haven't done as much hiking as I had thought I would um, and, until the last couple of years, especially during the pandemic. We've gotten outside a lot more. And so I finally been on Donaldson Run. Um, so here's her poem, Donaldson Run. The day was not ours, but we were in it, up to our knees in the water of a small 
Creek that feeds a famous river, one that touched the feet of men and women who went down in history. Perhaps they walked the small creek too, but it is not written. Likewise, our names are not in any book, but we write them on the rocks with water and leave before they evaporate. We take only things that have already fallen, dead leaves, the tuft of a dandelion blossom, and sail them downstream, watching until they snag on a stick or slip into the current. We are our own witnesses. No one, could, no one sees this but us, not even the sun cooling its head behind a cloud. Fantastic. I'm glad you chose that one. Like Jessica. OK, Susan, I won't forget you this time. <laughs> Who did you choose? <laughs> Thank you. I chose this poem by Laura Martin called Wild Angels um, because it's really about community. And it also has a nice sense of humor. And um, I find humor difficult to write in poems. So I, I always like it when people do it well. <laughs> so Wild Angels. Wild angels are my favorite kind. They have no idea where they left their halos and they let their robes run through fresh mud. They show up and change tires on highways, sit down and have a beer and listen. They come to hospital rooms to tell bad jokes, to food pantries when it's the end of the month and the money is run out. They believe in revelation unfolding in the sacred scripture we write between each other. That's great. Thank you, Susan. Um, okay, Catherine, you again, uh, and I think we had agreed that that uh, reading the poem from Hillary uh, was, was an ideal way to bring things somewhat full circle, but feel free to explain why you, why you feel that way. Well, so actually, Sean, I wanted to see if you would like to read uh, Memorial Day, your poem in the anthology. I mean, I'd be happy to. I, I, I didn't plan to, but um, I'd, be, I'd be honored. And I was certainly happy that uh, and, and thrilled that you chose it for inclusion. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so for me, I, I've mentioned uh, how I'm a lifelong Virginian, but um, and I, I certainly spent plenty of time in Arlington. but. Uh, for a period of about 10 years, starting in 2007, I had a job in Crystal City. So part of my daily commute to and from uh, was coming down George, uh, George Washington Parkway, which I still consider one of the great unknown national treasures because it, it allowed me to avoid 66. Um, but as I went into Crystal City, of course, um, I had to drive past Arlington Cemetery twice a day. And needless to say, that was it was always... Um, genuine opportunity to reflect and a very somber reminder uh, and, and very surreal, beautiful and surreal to drive by the cemetery and see the Washington Monument and just, I think, inevitably be reminded of, of the historical import of those monuments and what they represent. So this poem, uh, Memorial Day, attempts to you know, use a little bit of irony uh, for a day that I think as Americans, uh, we mean well, uh, as, as we often do in America, but perhaps we forget what we're celebrating and memorializing. So enough said, this is called Memorial Day. Unanticipated clouds advance, shifting the weight of the world, or at least the measured objectives of so many compulsory affairs. Nonplussed after all their time by their capacity to inspire, interrupt, or else frustrate the better angels of nature's encumbrance. Fathers linger absent-mindedly at inexhaustible grills. Mothers indulge in a quick cry behind bathroom doors, more from habit than necessity. Bored children fish in depleted ponds, muscle memory improvising rituals handed down unthinkingly, like faiths or families. Soldiers, acknowledged at last in their fortified shrines, die afresh each time a bouquet drops like a shell atop consecrated soil. Foretold fates secured again, courtesy of grim 
yet unconflicted officials whose solemn directives ensure that history repeats itself. And Catherine, I appreciate your editorial input. Uh, we definitely had talked about that and, and uh, how that poem could and should work down to the, the final word. And uh, I certainly continue to appreciate your, your shrewd editorial eye and generosity. So thank you for allowing me to, to include that. Thank you so much, Sean. You know, this is, I, I want to say a couple words because um, um, I had, I mentioned earlier that Kim Roberts uh, had an influence on this anthology and, but she had an influence even more profound because she was the person who started the program Moving Words, which was the poems on the bus. And among the, the poems that we heard today, Madeline Rosenberg's Dandelion, Lauren Mar Laura Martin's Wild Angels, those were all poems on the bus. Um, Todd's poem, um, the Kent Narrows came from from that that collection as well. So um, I feel like you know your poems, all of these poems that we have here together today in this anthology, um, are all making making something beautiful and and something ephemeral. And I hope making a sense of place for people who aren't poets, who are you know who just live in Arlington and drive to work every day, as you say, down the down the Parkway past. Um, past all of these monuments. Um, we have poems in the books by, by tourists who come to see those monuments, but most of us just drive by them. Um, and so that poem, that, that intentional thinking about Memorial Day and what the, what the cemetery means to all of us, I, you know, we saw in the pre recent presidential inauguration where they made a point of going out there to lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown. So I, I, you know, that cemetery and what it brings our community, I think sometimes those of us who live here don't really reckon uh, with, with its power. Um, I have a friend out in Wisconsin who, tweet, who tweeted out um, at the inauguration, the, the president-elect drove right by my parents' graves. Um, so, and, and she saw her parents' graves in the background. Um, so all of this richness and history, you know, all of these poems are contributing to it. And I'm, I'm so excited. Um, and I wanted to just say a word before I read the final poem to thank you, 1455, Day 8, the Anacostia Swim Club, and everybody who came out today to read and be part of this, this uh, group. I hope we'll keep doing this because this is building community. And especially at a time when we're all sitting in our homes and our little silos, um, you know, we can, we can um, at least think about when we get out of them what we're going to do. So I think I, we were going to close. Yes, Sean? Yep. Um, yep, with a poem by the late Hilary Tom, uh, who was one of my first introductions to um, poetry in Arlington. She ran at one time a poetry workshop out of the Lee Center on Lee Highway. I suspect both of those names are going to change really soon. Yeah. Um, and she was uh, a, an immigrant to Arlington from Malaysia. Um, and uh, she took Virginia, Virginia history, American history on her own terms, and she was clearly fascinated Robert E. Lee and so this poem is the last poem in the book. Um, Hillary died I believe around 2004, I may be wrong about that date. There is another poem in the book by Karen Alanier, her friend, talking about the cemetery that if you follow Lee Highway out into uh, Falls Church, the National Memorial Park, that is where Hillary Tom is actually buried. Um, and so this poem that obviously she wrote much before that, um, has a special resonance for me in thinking about um, her own personal story, her journey as an American immigrant, which is so much also a part of this book. So this poem is called The Road West by the late Hilary Tom. The Road West. Tickets, passports, traveler's checks. You chant a mantra as we head west on Lee Highway to the airport. In the distance, the smoke blue hills crouch low, straining their shoulders to bear up the sky. Blue sky or gray, there's a contagion of sadness to airports, funeral parlors. Each a nexus for departures, journeys in a sealed box, annihilates the ones who go, leaves those left like fish in glass jars, holding memory of river. So Robert E. Lee might have checked his sword, pistols before kissing his wife and children goodbye, riding his horse traveler west to battles not yet named, heavy the knowing they might never meet again. 
Still, the traveler goes lightly, reduces unwieldy possessions to two bags, the world to a page-sized map, becomes a bullet hurtling through air, detached from earth, gravity, the pull of attachments, lines tenuous and attenuating with distance. Until the day of return, when the traveler smiles in grateful disbelief that she has survived, the family has survived. But the moment passes and we resume our lives. We accept Carvel's, Carvel's ice cream turning into Joe's pizza, Hollywood video displacing El Sombrero, the brief as do passage of seasonal fruit and flower stands at the junction of Lee and Glebe. We take sunset, sunrise, time's motion as naturally as lifting an arm to slap a mosquito, the alarm clock before getting out of bed. Such effortless movement until the day the road calls, but feet do not move, muscles do not respond, hearts, lungs stay motionless. One final journey then on Lee Highway, west to the cemetery, where wind passes over cut grass and is gone. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. That, what, a, what a perfect uh, way to end the anthology. What a way to end this, this reading. Um, I, I want to sincerely thank all of the poets for being with us today, uh, reading their beautiful work, reading the work of others that couldn't uh, or are not with us. Um, but Catherine, the, the big thanks to you um, for, for literally bringing us all together on the page and here today in, in person. I think it just it just epitomizes the whole uh, the whole impetus and endeavor, right, of the endeavor to to to, to tell a story about a place we love and know, um, but to commemorate uh, these words in in this labor of love that we talked about. But also here today, I think demonstrating what really the point is: poets want to exchange ideas and their words uh, with other people. Um, I will remind those of you watching now live. We are recording this. I will make it a point. This will be on YouTube, and I will put it on the 1455 page uh, with links to everyone's bios so people can do a deeper dive into these poets that are with us today. And I sincerely hope that everyone that's, that's uh, tuning in supports Catherine's work uh, and, and buys a copy, buys two copies to share uh, with others and, and keeps this, this spirit alive. Um, I want to thank the Anacostia Swim Club for existing and extending the invitation to partner with them. Again, I'll mention in addition to today, we're doing another event. There's a series of events through the weekend of February 19th as well as March 19th. There'll be more poetry, there'll be other things. Uh, please do check that out at anacostiaswimclub.com. And again, you can find out more about the kind of collaborations we're doing at 1455litarts.org. But today, Catherine, it's all about you. It's all about this anthology. Uh, finally, I, I thank you yet again for all the effort, uh, the goodwill. Uh, you've done something very beautiful. Uh, and again, as a, as a Northern Virginia resident, I, I thank you. I celebrate this work. I celebrate the work you did. And again, it was a real honor to be part of this extraordinary reading today. So thank you all for being here. And uh, we will read and speak again, hopefully in person. Um, but please know, each of you individually, uh, 1455 is always going to be interested in your work. So please let me know how I can help promote and share the work you've done and continue to do. And that we can all do so again, you know, again, as a group. Uh, Zoom is always, As Catherine said, Zoom will always be here, and that's wonderful. But I look forward, thinking about 2021, that we'll be able to kind of break bread and hear each other's voices in person. Um, so here's to that. Thank uh, you so much, Sean. It was such a great honor. Thank you, everybody who came. Thank you, uh, Sally, Todd, Susan, Jessica, Brian, um, and Hanan, wherever you are. Um, we're so glad to have you. Thank you so much. Right on. Well, folks, to be continued, but uh, for today, thanks again for being here. I really got a lot out of uh, seeing and hearing you read, and uh, I look forward to more of the same. So be well, stay safe, and keep writing.
Take care, everybody. Thank you.